The Old Testament reading for the 17th Sunday after Trinity is from Proverbs chapter 25. Do not put yourself forward in the king's presence or stand in the place of the great, for it is better to be told, come up here, than to be put lower in the presence of a noble. What your eyes have seen do not hastily bring into court, for what will you do in the end when your neighbor puts you to shame? Argue your case with your neighbor himself, and do not reveal another's secret, lest he who hears you bring shame upon you, and your ill repute have no end. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. Like a gold ring or an ornament of gold is a wise reprover to a listening ear. Like the cold of snow in the time of harvest is a faithful messenger to those who send him. He refreshes the soul of his masters. Like clouds and wind without rain is a man who boasts of a gift he does not give. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We continue with the gradual together. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. The epistle is from Ephesians chapter 4. I therefore, prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, O One Sabbath, when Jesus went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. And behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus responded to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. Then he took him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, Which of you, having a son or an ox, that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day will not immediately pull him out. And they could not reply to these things. Now he told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, Give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, Friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humble, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. This is the Gospel of the Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen. Imagine for a moment that you're in your backyard with your family, your friends, your neighbors, and you're having some burgers and dogs and bratwurst, and you've got a cooler full of, well, let's just call them refreshments for everyone. And you're all having a great time, enjoying the end of summer or the beginning of fall. And if that's not really your thing, then 
Just imagine for yourself, you're gathered around the kitchen table or the dining room table having a feast for Thanksgiving or Christmas or whatever holiday you want to have in your mind. Whichever scenario you prefer, what would you do if someone showed up that you don't know, you didn't invite, and nobody else there knows either, and they come and they presume to take your chair, your place? You'd probably be a little peeved, if not a little bit annoyed. Who is this person? What are they doing here? Who do they think they are? It's rather arrogant for anyone to do such a thing, but it does happen, not in these ways necessarily, but it happens in other parts of life all the time. You do it, I do it, everyone does, because everybody thinks of themselves very highly. Everyone is their own favorite topic. The mindset is either, I deserve this, or nobody can tell me not to. Because we always want what's best for ourselves. And when it comes to sin, our flesh doesn't, doesn't like it. Even when it has to deal with the things of God, the things that really are the best for us. Luther writes in the Heidelberg Disputation of 1518, so this is over 500 years ago, while a person is doing what is in him, he sins and seeks himself in everything. But if he should suppose that through sin he would become worthy of or prepared for grace, he would add haughty arrogance to his sin and not believe that sin is sin, and evil is evil, which is an exceedingly great sin. Now, isn't that interesting to read from the year 1518? Doing what is in him. We hear something like that today in our culture, in our society. You do you. You ever heard that phrase? Don't hear it as much as we did three or four years ago, but it's still around. I've said it. You probably have too. Nothing has changed in over 500 years. For even King Solomon says that there is nothing new under the sun. People were probably saying something like that during Solomon's time. The sin that dwells within, that corrupts you, doesn't want to hear about humility. It doesn't want to hear that something is wrong. It doesn't want to hear that something is sinful. While a person is doing what is in him, you do you, he sins and seeks himself in everything, Luther says. Jesus is having dinner at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, and Jesus notices that the others that were invited, they're choosing the places of honor. They're figuring out how to best position themselves over and above the other people that had been, that had been invited. And while they're doing all this, they're watching Jesus carefully. And what seems like out of nowhere, a man with dropsy comes in. You know what dropsy is? Dropsy is where the body retains fluid. And it's very disfiguring and very painful. And it wasn't that long ago that there was no medical treatment for it. So it's very obvious to everyone present that this man is very sick and most likely to die. But Jesus sees right through their poorly planned trap and he says, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? Well, of course it is. Earlier this month, we heard from the epistle lesson from St. Paul's epistle to the Galatians. Against such things, there is no law. Against all these things, there's no law of doing good, of loving your neighbor, of helping those in need. There's no law prohibiting the doing of, do, 
there's no law prohibiting the doing of good for the neighbor. There is no law against having compassion on someone. The Pharisees wanted to trap Jesus, seeing if he would dare to do work again on the Sabbath. Because this isn't the first time that Jesus has run into this with the Pharisees. But do you notice the response of the Pharisees? Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? How did the Pharisees respond? They remained silent. Why do they remain silent? Because they know the answer. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? It is. The Pharisees and the lawyers, a sect of the Pharisees, they were the experts in the Torah, the books of Moses. And so Jesus heals this man and sends him away. And then he gives... Jesus gives them a lesson from Deuteronomy chapter 22. He almost paraphrases it, almost word for word, about a son or an ox who is down a well. You're to help that person. And now how do they respond? Because Jesus points out to them, hey, you guys know the answer to this already. Why aren't you saying it? Why are you trying to trap me in this when you know the answer? You know what Moses says. They could not reply to these things. Jesus got him. He caught him in their own trap. And they're too busy hoisting themselves up, claiming honor and prowess like a gloating peacock that the lesson goes in one ear and out the other. And yet even in the midst of all their positioning for places of honor, Jesus leaves them speechless. Now what do you do when you see or hear someone else strutting around like that, thinking very highly of themselves? What do you do when you're the one strutting around like that, when you do you and you catch yourself or someone else points it out to you, what do you do? Your first response is probably going to be the response of your corrupted flesh, of the old Adam, who doesn't like it when sin and arrogance are pointed out. And the response is either to ignore it or fight against it. And either one is the result of a seared conscience that's been hardened against the word of God. Have you ever uttered the phrase, or maybe you've heard someone utter the phrase, I don't care what the Bible says. Or the flip side of that coin is, well, that's just your interpretation. You ever heard either one of those? Maybe you've even said one of those before. Does the Holy Spirit need to make things even more clear than he already has? Because apparently he hasn't, if it's just a matter of interpretation. And when you find yourself in that position where you don't care what the Word of God says, or that's just your interpretation, aren't you putting yourself in the position of honor? above Jesus, above the Holy Spirit, who inspired the holy men of God to write these things? In church, we make jokes about sitting in the back pew, and we laugh about it, because it's kind of true. And while you might sit at the back of a church on Sunday mornings, what about the rest of the week? Where do you position yourself? Maybe not physically, but where do you position yourself the rest of the week? Maybe you just play the victim card. So you can garner sympathy from other people around you, like, there's an injustice that's been done to me. 
you should be sympathetic towards me because of this. Because that's the thing to do today, right? Be the victim? Or at least pretend to be the victim? And thereby you shut down anyone who disagrees with you? I can ignore certain things, certain facts, and I can cherry-pick other facts and even opinions to support myself or my own views to prove I'm in the right. When you do you. Remember I said earlier that we're all our own favorite topics. Naturally, that makes every one of you put yourself forward into the best positions in life, whatever it might be. There's no thought or concern for someone else. There's no mercy or compassion for those who are in need, who are hurting, who are downtrodden. Like the man with dropsy. He was being used as a prop by the Pharisees and the lawyers to trap Jesus, to see if he would dare to do work on the Sabbath. It wasn't about this poor man who was in need of mercy and compassion. It isn't about the neighbor, about anyone else. It's all about you. You do you. Luther goes on. Now you ask, what then shall I do? Shall we go our way with indifference because we can do nothing but sin? I would reply, by no means. But having heard this, fall down and pray for grace and place your hope in Christ, in whom is our salvation, life, and resurrection. For this reason, we are so instructed. For this reason, the law makes us aware of sin, so that having recognized our sin, we may seek and receive grace. Thus, God gives grace to the humble, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. The law humbles. Grace exalts. The law affects fear and wrath. Grace affects hope and mercy. It's by the law of God that you recognize you don't deserve any place of honor. Remember the Pharisee and the tax collector we heard a couple months ago? We see the Pharisee boasting of himself before God, claiming the place of honor. But the tax collector sat in the back pew, standing far off. And he wouldn't lift his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast and begged for the blood of the Lamb to cover him. Which one was humble? And which one exalted himself? You have been brought here gathered by the Holy Spirit through the power of the gospel. And in this place, you sit in the place of honor in God's house, at his banquet, at his feast. For here, you are served by God himself. This is the place where God deals with his servants according to his steadfast love, as we prayed in the intro. Here you are exalted. Not because of your greatness before God and man. You're exalted because of Jesus, who humbled himself and gave himself into death for your salvation. And he invites you to the feast of his body and blood. He invites you to come and to kneel at his table and to receive your God upon your lips. For here you dwell in his holy presence, for this is holy ground. 
and you hear him speak a better word, the word of forgiveness. Humility and humbleness are good. You don't really care what the Bible says? Are you wiser than the Holy Spirit? Are you smarter than him? Do you know more than God? Humble yourself under his wisdom. That is the cross of Jesus. That is foolishness in the eyes of the world, in the eyes of those who are perishing. That it is the wisdom of God for all who would be saved. For by the power of the gospel, you are, you are no longer curved inward to think only of yourself, to put yourself forward, but you're curved outward. Like Jesus is with the man with dropsy. He was a prop by the Pharisees. But Jesus has compassion. He sees this man in need. So you don't use other people as props. You don't use other people for your own benefit to use and then throw away. But you see your brother and sister in need, in pain, in sin, and you help them. You have compassion on them. You speak God's word to them. Just as God in Christ has compassion on you. He gives you the seat of honor in his house. He heals you. He feeds you. And then he sends you home. In the name of Jesus. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.